Good afternoon to you. Mark Sutt with HurricaneTrack.com here with your off-season edition of the Hurricane Outlook and Discussion for Monday, April 9th, 2018. Thanks for joining me. Last week, no updates. Really, I kind of was off the grid, but not off the grid. I was in South Padre Island, Texas for the National Tropical Weather Conference, and it was a pretty benign week overall. Well, certainly for the tropics and... Uh, you know, if you're following me on Twitter, I was tweeting about things, but it's the only week of the year where I didn't do an update. And now I'm back in the office, and it's great to be back in North Carolina after a very productive week out in South Padre with the National Tropical Weather Conference. Learned a lot of things, met some new people, and uh, generally good times had by all. So now it's time to get back to work. Believe me, that was work too. It's three days of basically nine to five conference and I know you're like oh poor baby had to work nine to five <laughs> it's pretty intense a lot of speakers and uh, you know you should go to every session you don't have to uh, if you know conferences you know how that works and so after three days of straight conference stuff Wednesday Thursday Friday and then a lot of mingling with everybody it's time to get back to work on this end of things as we are now less than 60 days ahead of the hurricane season. And that brings us to our first stop on the tour today, the SOI. And as you can see, the contributor today, slightly negative, but the 90-day is a healthy 5.71, and the 30-day average is up to 11.08. And as you can see, the trend in the 30-day has been generally up, and it's markedly better in terms of seeing that trend on the 90-day average in the SOI. And again, this is very important because it tells us that the pressure pattern is not near that that would support an El Nino as of yet. It's nowhere near there. Basically, we need to see this number uh, come down quite a bit and be well below zero. It's just an index. All right? It's not really measuring anything per se like a temperature or whatever, it's an index. And it tells us where it is on that index. And a negative number in the index, sustained negative, uh, is more of an atmosphere conducive for El Nino. And right now we don't see that. So that is one of the basis reasons behind why Colorado State University's first forecast for the 2018 hurricane season is for slightly above average activity. This part of the tropical Pacific not expected to be that much above average come peak time of the hurricane season. And the Atlantic is, we'll talk about that in a second, but without El Nino, that's automatically a big check mark for favorability in the Atlantic. When you have this abnormal warming out through here, that air rises uh, in the Pacific, you have rising motion, then it sinks over here in the Atlantic. It spreads out across the tropics, and these waves of low pressure coming across run into that. The air is drier that way. It's just very negative. And so no El Nino is a big deal, all right? What's happening in the Atlantic Basin? Well, the main development region through here has been warming ever so slightly, but steadily over the last few weeks. And the tr subtropics up here are yeah, kind of holding their own uh, I'm going to show you a wider shot in just a minute. Gulf of Mexico, generally warmer than average overall. Most of the Atlantic, except for the extreme eastern parts of the tropical and subtropical Atlantic over here, are running at or above the long-term average. And we can see that better on a global perspective if we stretch this Mercator projection map all the way out. And uh, now it's a flat Earth. <laughs> Maybe that's what they mean when they say we live on a flat earth. There's your flat earth. Um, I just threw that in for no good reason. But down here, warming up just a little bit. And, you know, way up here in the far north Atlantic, not as cold as we saw the last few years. You know, maybe next week we can do a comparison, give us something different to talk about. But the bottom line, there's nothing striking or shocking or headline-making and if there's a headline worthy to be made, I'll make it. If there's not, we're not going to make any. Everything's just kind of moving along as expected. No major ups or downs either way. 
And again, that pressure pattern in the Pacific is not necessarily one that is going to create a lot of westerly winds this way, uh, pushing all of this warm water towards and overspreading the equatorial, tropical, central, and eastern Pacific. Does that make sense? And we can see that pretty good here in the subsurface analysis. This was recently updated. Let's change this back over to black. Large area of subsurface warmth, and that's where it's staying. So far, no big mechanism to get this to what we call uh, upwell to the surface. The trade winds over here are strong enough out of the east to keep this at bay, and we'll just keep watching this. It's there, waiting below the surface, and we're talking about, on average here, there's your 100 meters deep line right there, uh, straight a line as I can draw. So most of the warmth, especially the substantial warmth, is below 100 meters of depth. So it's going to take quite a bit of relaxation of these easterlies over here that come this way, and really to get those to reverse and come this way to allow this to surface and cause an El Nino. And that might happen later in the year. September, October, November maybe into December, and that's typically when an El Nino will really begin to manifest itself is December, the winter months, but nothing for the hurricane season that I can see just yet. And we can all see it together. You see, I'm not making this up. There it is. All right, also another item of note that generally affects Atlantic sea surface temperatures is the North Atlantic Oscillation. And we can see that for a good deal of the winter, it was positive over here, and then it went negative for a little bit, and now it's on the rebound just a little. But the next 7 to 10 to 14 days, uh, the overall ensemble mean looks like it's going to try to go negative again, and that would reduce the trade winds across the tropical Atlantic even out to 14 days. Generally speaking, not very positive, but even somewhat negative NAO values. Again, it's just an index, and if that happens, then we would expect to see perhaps more warming out through this region through here. All right? So these are all the things that we can keep track of as we begin to really close in on the Atlantic hurricane season going forward. The NAO, the SOI, sea surface temperature anomalies, things like that. Actual sea surface temperatures, I went down here to South Padre Island, Went on the, on the beach for a little bit, but it was too cold. <laughs> yep, it was too cold. We had a front that came through, and uh, that blue norther, as they call it, that was awful. Uh, the rest of the days, I didn't, I think it was on the second to last day that I went out on the beach, something like that. The water temperature, I don't know, 70, 71 Fahrenheit, but it was too brisk for much beach weather. Uh, and if you saw Josh Morgerman, I think he tweeted about that that he went out on the beach, put his toes in, but the sand was blowing pretty good. Very strong winds while we were there. Pretty strong winds around this region as it is. It's a good area for wind farms. All right, rest of the Gulf here, talking about sea surface temperatures. 26 degrees Celsius all through here, 27, and a little smidgen of 28. What does that mean? Well, we're talking 80, 81, 82 degrees Fahrenheit, and we can see this large area bubbling up through the loop current. Nothing, again, that's got me concerned. We know that the Gulf of Mexico will always be warm enough for hurricanes, no matter what time of the hurricane season it is. Once they form, and if you remember Harvey last year is a great example of this, once they form, you know, Harvey came up and they made landfall up here, and it passed near or over a very a large area of deep warm water. Those eddies, as they're called, we worry about that later. Once you have something develop, we've got to get away from looking at something now and saying that it's going to have bearing on something later when it is an anomaly of substantial proportion. In other words, if we look at the Gulf temps over here and we say, oh, look, it's mostly above normal, that means busy hurricane season ahead for the Gulf, that is false. That is absolutely false. It does not mean that. It means nothing. It just means probably an active severe weather season because that is upon us. So we're going to make sure we keep those facts straight. All right, that's part of my job. All right, so off the 
east coast of the U.S. and the western Atlantic. The overall gradient through here of temperature relaxing a little bit as these water temperatures warm, obviously warmer to the south and east. Again, nothing major here. This has all been quite a bit above the long-term average, as you can see on this chart again. Most of the northwest Atlantic has been well above normal over the last several years, so no changes from that. Shifting out of the tropics to lower 48 weather, it's good to see this map relatively blank. There's a few, what are these, blues got to mean something cold, right? Uh, frost advisories, is that right? It's not, yeah, it's a freeze watch. Okay, so those, it's not heavy freezing spray. Not in Oklahoma and Arkansas. This is a freeze watch. An abnormal trough has carved its way into the lower 48. We can see that here in the GFS. I want to show you this. And then we're going to look at the Storm Prediction Center and then end it with a look at Levi's site, Tropical Tidbits. But check it out. you got ridging out over the west here. Nice ridge out here. And then this broad trough just kind of carved out over a huge area of the eastern part of North America, really. So you're still draining some of this cold air out of Canada into this trough system down into the lower 48. So there you go. You've got your freeze watch set up for portions of the Deep South uh, or vicinity. If anyone can grab this thing, thank you. Uh, so let's put this guy into motion. I want to show you the next, uh, what is it, seven, five days. All right. So watch this trough as it moves along. There's the ridge. It flattens. And the trough starts to, these pieces of energy, the axis moves away. And then you get this energy trying to dig in, trying to dig into the uh, southwest, the Four Corners region. And it ejects out into the central and southern plains over the next five days. You see that right there? You start here. This is about three days out. So now we're having a more zonal flat flow in the east, so things will start to warm up. But then you get this energy starting to come out into the lower portions, right around the Four Corners area. There you go, uh, the Great Basin in the south. And then that gets sent out into the plains. And this is important because that represents energy. All of that, this color, this vorticity in this part of the atmosphere, this is energy. And at this time of year, that kind of energy uh, is prone to cause severe weather. Why? You have the clashes of the air masses, but also at the surface you're going to have high pressure sitting out here, and your return flow around that high pressure is going to pump juicy, warm, unstable air off of that warm Gulf of Mexico, meeting up with this storm system here, and that's your battle zone right there. This is easy meteorology to figure out. The large-scale pieces, where it happens, that's a different story. And that's what the Storm Prediction Center looks at. The next few days, not really a big deal. We still have a lot of cold air around. But once the warm air makes that return flow again coming off the Gulf, this is day five. And this is a low probability right now. This will go up over the next few days. But you folks here in portions of the Mississippi Valley, uh, and points west of there, Arkansas, northern Louisiana, eastern Oklahoma, eastern Texas, and you know that this will change over time, but this is your target. Be careful, well, when the time comes, but be aware until that time comes, all right? Severe weather season is coming, and it's you know, we've already seen the results of that, and it's just going to ramp up from here. So this is what it looks like on Levi Cowan's site here, the GFS uh, over the next five days. Notice off the coast of the Carolinas, little low pressure area, cold high pressure to its north. There's all your cold air up there, just disgusting. It's time to get rid of it. So let's move on through. You see how that ejects out. But watch here by about day two and three, storminess comes into the west coast of the U.S. A few little features skirting across the northern tier of the United States, but no big deal. But then watch, there's our high pressure area scooting off the eastern coast and that return flow you see those isobars coming around and that's going to pump all that warm moist air and that's unstable air into the southern plains the lower mississippi valley so that by day four into day five there's your eruption of convective activity 
right where the Storm Prediction Center has outlined that on the Day 5 Outlook. There's your high pressure area, and it all lines up. See, so this is where it matters, all that warm air getting advected laterally, horizontally, into these storm systems. And on the backside, more misery with cold and snow and wind. This will be a big, big weather maker. And this is next weekend, Friday the 13th into Saturday the 14th. This is when we really have to watch that. All right? So there you have it. Everything's up to date now. Back in the office, we're good to go on an even playing field again. We're good, right? All right, so I'm working on the part two. People have been asking about that of the documentary for 2017, and it'll be ready on April the 20th. I figure that'll be a good day to drop it in on YouTube. And then when I get that out there, I will announce and put a page up for a limited release DVD version what I call the director's cut version that will have a, a few more minutes overall of added features in each segment. Part 1 and 2 will be a little longer on the DVD. And then there will be a third part like the bonus features. Well, there really won't be a part 1 and 2. It will be combined into one movie that will be almost three hours long. It's like Lord of the Rings here. <laughs> All right? But last year was big. we got to make sure we cover everything. So I'm going to put a director's cut version out that will have a few extra scenes in it. And uh, and then I'm going to have like a little separate bonus features that will be a surprise. Something different, but related. You'll see. And that DVD uh, offering, I'm only going to make 100 of them. And they're going to be 30 bucks, including shipping. And there's only going to be 100 of them. And I will autograph them and send them. And you can have it. You know, some people don't have DVD players anymore, but at least you've got something in your hand, I guess. There's just something about it. People still like that. But first, we're going to have that thing ready for viewing on YouTube. I want everybody to be able to see it. Uh, kind of a showcase of our efforts and our pro uh, progress and our success Friday, April 20th. I think that's if Friday the 13th and seven days later, that's 20, right? So <laughs> Friday, April 20th. Mark's good at math. All right. Have a great rest of your week. I appreciate you tuning in. It's my pleasure to bring you this information, but I also need you to watch on your end. So don't forget to subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already. And whenever we do any events in the future, you'll be notified. Have a good one. I'm MarkSaddleThurricaneTrack.com. Thanks again for watching. We'll talk again next Monday.